All right, everybody. It says I'm live, and if that's the case, please let me know in the chat. That way we can move forward and start discussing what this next signal is you should watch out for based on what it would mean. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Every Monday night we do this. If you're here on the replay, thanks for being here, replay crew. Much appreciated. And we have five by fives coming in. Chris Onimo says 556 by 45 or the lack thereof. <laughs> so I can appreciate that. And then we also have five by five coming from Liberty Off-Road. And we're seeing some more good five by fives coming through. So thank you all so much. We have John Bill 1776 here, Mr. Landfill, Harbor Prepper, Razor Wire, Scott B, and Urban Homestead. Thank you all so much. So things to talk about tonight and one of the reasons why i'm bringing this up is because there's so much activity happening right now that's kind of hard to figure out what to pay attention to or what could move things into a more escalatory direction right uh so based on some historical precedent we can actually see what can tell us what will happen next especially regarding the current movements of these carrier strike groups so let's talk about that and that's exactly the main subject of tonight, but we will also discuss some other things happening here in the U.S. as well as some other egregious situations occurring around the world that could easily lead us towards more difficult scenarios as well. And this is all within this last week, so be aware of this, okay? Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group arrives in Mediterranean. This is from October 28th. Naples, Italy. The Dwight D. Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group arrived in the Mediterranean Sea on Saturday after passing through the Strait of Gibraltar on its way to the Middle East. The Carrier Strike Group's passage into the wider region comes as the U.S. works to stabilize the Middle East while it supports Israel and protects American service members under attack in Iraq and Syria, according to the Pentagon. Now, keep in mind, this is the second Carrier Strike Group that was sent to the Mediterranean for this particular purpose. Eisenhower's entrance into the Mediterranean was documented by ship watchers and open source intelligence analysts on the social media platform X. USS Dwight D. Eisenhower Nimitz class aircraft carrier found in the city of Gibraltar, October 28, 2023, posted at Warship Cam, along with several photos of the carrier and destroyers USS Gravely and USS Mason. So this wasn't necessarily announced by the Navy, but it was shared with everybody on social media because a lot of this Tracking occurs, of course, and people are paying attention to what's happening with ship movements, especially right now. Some of those analysts also noted the Bataan Amphibious Ready Group, including the dock landing ship USS Carter Hall and the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit had moved into the Red Sea on Friday. The Bataan Amphibious Ready Group, consisting of the USS Bataan, USS Carter Hall, and approximately 2,500 Marines from the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit, entered the Red Sea on October 27th headed toward waters near Israel, along with satellite images of the group, okay, um, or that was posted. So this is all bolstering the USS Gerald Ford carrier strike group that's already in the region. What does this tell us? And here it says Eisenhower departed its home port in Norfolk, Virginia, October 14th, part of a scheduled deployment, presumably to relieve the Gerald R. Ford carrier strike group already on duty in the Mediterranean. But days after Hamas militants killed 1,400 civilians in Israel, the Ford and Eisenhower were ordered to the eastern Mediterranean. Ford's six-month deployment was extended. Okay, so we have a deployment that was extended, and we have a deployment that was supposed to be relief that is now working with the carrier strike group it was supposed to relieve. Why is this relevant? Because the signal we're looking out for is for any other strike groups to be deployed to that region. And there's a lot of reasons for why that would be the signal for you to see that we're about to or have already entered into the war directly in a hot way, aka an official entrance into this conflict. Right now, we're already in the conflict via proxy. But once things go hot in the sense of publicly official, it changes the attitude, the morale, and the perception of the general populace. And that can actually lead to quite a bit of interesting behavior, especially in the realm of panic or who knows what else, right? So that's why this matters. I'm operating currently as if we're already in World War III, because in my opinion, we are, um, because nobody in 1930 nine looking at what happened to poland was like this is world war ii right that was said after the fact so we have to understand where we're at in regards to the slow escalation through this process of conflict um, but if you're operating under that mentality right now it allows you to 
be a little bit more prepared than maybe you would usually be, but it also allows you to read into the information that's being put out there from a different point of view, especially regarding sifting through propaganda and things of that nature, right? So let's see here. Approaching target says two carrier groups are attached to four nuclear subs, okay? And then we also have uh, <laughs> Razor Wire says, yeah, baby, let's get them de desert mushrooms to sprout. Them. So here's the thing. Um, we are in a very interesting time, and obviously there's a lot of uh, uh, delicate conversation to be had around what's about to occur over in the Middle East. But uh, this signal has historical precedent, and that's what we're going to discuss now so that you can kind of see there's a roadmap to why this is all important and why it can show you what to expect here moving forward into the future. And before we move forward, I do want to mention that Midway USA is the biggest supporter of the channel. And of course, thanks to them, I can get on here, give you this information, talk about some of the things related to preparedness that we talk about here on this channel. And all, all in all, they just help support me with moving forward. So a big thanks to Midway USA. And I will say, uh, let's see, Ruchanel Van asked if 308 is still my caliber of choice for SHDF. I still think it's a superior caliber to 556 in regards to ballistics and terminal energy uh, on target when it comes to performance. But for my skill level, I had to take a step back and move back to the 5.56 cartridge in order to ensure that I was at the efficiency level required for a higher caliber, more powerful cartridge. And that's just me being honest with myself. So, uh, but a new 308 is in the works and will be part of the channel here in the relative future. So look out for that. And there will be some information surrounding those choices at that point in time. Okay? Now, Let's see here. What historical evidence do we have as to why this will be the signal? In case you're just joining me right now, uh, we're talking about how if another carrier strike group or any other major naval activity is sent to the Mediterranean to link up with the current two carrier strike groups that are there, you're basically being told at that point in time a lot more than the U.S. is directly involved in. Why is that? Well, first off, let's talk about, we're going to go back in time for a little bit, and then we're going to get back to where we're at right now regarding some of these more strange happenings here in the world, especially here in the United States, as well as some other places that we need to pay attention to. But let's go back to the Vietnam War first, okay? At any given time, two to four carrier groups were, were on active duty at Yankee Station and Dixie Station which were sections of like the South China Sea uh, that were, you know, patrolled during the Vietnam War. Carrier crews varied in size depending on the class of the ship, but each carrier required a crew of about 3,000 to 5,500 men. Those crews were by far the largest in the fleet, and thus a substantial proportion of sailors who served in the Blue Water Navy in Vietnam served aboard carriers. Destroyers carried complements of several hundred men, cruisers uh, generally 1,000 to 1,400 men, okay? So... In Vietnam, and this is from the National Library of Medicine, just to give you an idea, because this is actually an article about the effects of Agent Orange and things like that on our troops back then, uh, but it did have the information surrounding the amount of various strike groups that were in the region. And there was two to four. So right now we already have two over there. During Vietnam, two was an appropriate number for the conflict, but it was up to four during certain times of necessity. Let's move on from there. Now, this is where I think it becomes even more obvious that this could be uh, the next step of escalation and that we might already be there in many ways, but that if we do see an additional strike group arrive, it is all hands on deck, I guess is what you could say. So let's talk about the Persian Gulf, which is in much closer proximity to that area right now uh, than the Vietnam War, of course, and in a lot more proactively regarding the timeline as to where we are now in our modern history. So, let me see here. Just verify everything's still working well here on the stream. Okay. Operation Desert Shield. So, this is very interesting, and this is why this could be a huge signal, okay? The Persian Gulf War was in many ways started similarly to what we're seeing happening in Israel and Gaza right now regarding the suddenness of it the almost like surprise aspect of it. Of course, everybody's going to speculate as to what the deep state was aware of or any of that other stuff. But regardless, this wasn't something that was overly planned. This was something that occurred and then was responded to, much like what we're witnessing in Israel. So just to give you a little background here to see how close we are and why this is a signal you should be watching out for. 
Saddam's conquest of Kuwait had been achieved in short order. He seemed poised to continue his military push into Saudi Arabia. Conquering Saudi Arabia would give Saddam control of more than 40% of the world's oil reserves, as well as two of the holiest sites in the Islamic world, Mecca and Medina. With Iraqi troops on the Saudi border, King Fahd, in an unprecedented move, invited Western and Arab forces to deploy in the kingdom in support of the Saudi defense forces. Keep that in mind. The U.S. immediately dispatched elements of its rapid deployment force. This included the Ready Brigade of the 82nd Airborne Division, the U.S. Marine Corps First Expeditionary Force, and two squadrons of U.S. Air Force F-15s. Two U.S. Navy carrier battle groups were also deployed to the Persian Gulf. The U.S. ground contingent was a relatively lightly equipped tripwire force. Even if Saudi Arabian and other Arab armies had rushed to the area, it is unlikely that the hastily assembled defenders could have repelled a concerted Iraqi attack. Nevertheless, this initial U.S. deployment deterred Saddam from attacking Saudi Arabia and initiating a war with the U.S. and its allies. So this response that we're currently seeing in many ways, is very similar to what occurred regarding the Persian Gulf War. It started off with two carrier strike groups responding to this immediate threat. But it didn't end with that, of course. On paper, the Iraqi military looked formidable. Its army was the fifth largest in the world with some 950,000 personnel. Okay, This was not a force to be taken lightly. Over the following months, the U.S. military carried out its largest overseas deployment since World War II. By mid-November, the U.S. had more than 240,000 troops in the Gulf and another 200,000 on the way. And the United Kingdom had sent more than 25,000. Egypt, 20,000. And France, fi- Fr- <laughs> French. France 5,500. Okay? Here's the thing you should take away from that particular part of this article. Over the following months, we carried out our largest overseas deployment since World War II. So this whole thing started with two carrier strike groups responding to an imminent Iraqi invasion of Saudi Arabia. And then over the following months, we were able to build up our forces and then actually have a hot war conflict in that region. This should tell you a lot, especially in regards to if we see additional movement in that region. If another carrier strike group goes there and we are able to, you know, begin this Persian Gulf War scenario with two strike groups. And in Vietnam, we had two to four throughout the entirety of the war. I think that this is a great indicator for us to pay attention to in the sense of how things will look very quickly thereafter if we officially enter the situation. Now, another thing that I want you to pay attention to is what happened during Operation Iraqi Freedom, because it was a very different situation. And you might go back and look at that and say, well, you know, Magic Prepper, I don't think this is as big of a deal then because during Operation Iraqi Freedom, at the war's height, there were six aircraft carrier battle groups in the Mediterranean Sea and Persian Gulf. The USS Theodore Roosevelt, USS Harry S. Truman, the USS Constellation, USS Abraham Lincoln, USS Kitty Hawk, and the USS Nimitz. There are also 23 amphibious task groups, ships in the region carrying more than 10,000 Marines. So a much larger force was put together. So If you're thinking, well, okay, you're saying if a third strike group goes that we should be aware that that's the signal for this war going hot. But if there's, you know, six at Operation Iraqi Freedom, maybe we have four more to go, right? Well, that's not the case. And that's why I just want to kind of show you this to make sure everybody was on the same page and that it wasn't just, you know, pulling cherry picked historical precedent to kind of make a point. It's more about actually going and finding out the reasons behind the differences here. Here. And understand that that Persian Gulf War scenario right there was a response to an invasion of Iraq or, or Iraq invading, right? So Iraq had already invaded Kuwait and then they were on their way to Saudi Arabia. And that's when we responded upon request. This is a different situation. Having the Navy there on that team clearly was a lesson learned from Desert Storm. What other lessons were drawn from this most recent combat? This was a different war, perhaps obviously. And this is from Vice Admiral Keating. But for some not so apparent reasons, it was a joint war fighting at the highest form of the art I've ever seen. The component commanders working for General Tommy Franks had spent about a year formulating this plan. So understand they had a year to formulate the plan for Operation Iraqi Freedom, which meant they could go in with all the heavy hitting equipment that they had access to. 
I was just bragging on how a joint a war this was. But from the naval perspective, the CNO had told me early on that I would have anything at my disposal to present to General Franks. So there were five carrier strike groups, more than a dozen submarines, scores of surface ships, military sea lift command ships, and amphibious task forces, east and west, all of which deployed and arrived in theater ready well before the war started. It was remarkable. So the difference there is that they planned it for a year. Now, say what you want about the potential deep state knowledge of these things happening before they occur and everything else related to that. But regardless, if... What happened in Israel was indeed a surprise that nobody was prepared for. Then we had to make hasty arrangements to get another carrier strike group in the region, which means we may take a little bit longer to get things going we saw in the lead up to the Gulf War. And that's why I think that this is a big deal, because if we see that additional movement, things are going to be looking um, very kinetic very quickly. And... I have said many times here on this chat, as well as on the channel, that I, you know, like I said, I believe World War III has already begun, and that when we go back to look through the history books, we're going to say, oh, it started about this time, this day, right? Because that's just what somebody arbitrarily decides at some point in time. Uh, but if you're already preparing under that assumption, then you don't have to panic or freak out or anything about it, right? If you're already focused on what's important during a time of war, then things getting hot or escalating to a certain degree won't necessarily change how you react to it, but it allows you to be prepared and posed for the general population's sudden realization of such, right? Them suddenly realizing that this is actually real changes the dynamic quite a bit. Suddenly people are buying a lot of food. Suddenly people are buying a lot of fuel. Suddenly people are concerned with preparedness and who knows what else they're purchasing, but apply it to much what we saw in 2020. How many people went out and panic bought firearms and ammunition and everything else, right? Because of a, a pandemic. Now apply that to global war. I mean, I'm mostly concerned about how the general population is going to react. So having these indicators, these signals to watch out for allows you to seize the, the the moment a little bit more strategically, right? It allows you to, to see the timing as it's coming through and then act before the masses, right? So that's why this is important. It's not about panicking or, or freaking out about it because if you're already operating under this assumption, then you don't have to worry about that. It's important so that you can strategically react and move appropriately based on where we're at on that timeline of escalation. And in my opinion, and just based on historical precedent and everything else that we've seen from these previous conflicts, two strike groups is enough to get things going, but they will have more once we're in a full-on hot war. And in Vietnam, that was up to four. Operation Iraqi Freedom, it was up to six. Right now we're at two, which is what we started with regarding the Gulf War. What's next, right? So just based on that information, my thought process and just what I wanted to share share with everybody here is that if you see another carrier strike group start moving to the Mediterranean to link up with the other two that are already established there, you know it's not just about regional stability any longer. And we do need time for these things. I mean, I believe it said the USS Eisenhower left port on October 14th, and it just recently passed through the Strait of Gibraltar on the 28th. So it takes a lot of time to get these strike groups and these carriers into position. So you can't expect things to just happen tomorrow. Right. But if you can see these movements occurring, then that expectation can start to build up and you can say, look, they just let another strike group out of port. I know last time it took about two weeks for the Eisenhower to arrive. That means I've got about two weeks before I can guarantee that we're actually in a new phase of this whole conflict scenario. And what does that allow me for? It allows me to get better prepared throughout the meantime. That's my thought process. That's why I'm trying to put this information out there because. I mean, if you're prepping already, great. But it's not about you always, right? Don't be so selfish in your mindset that it, all that matters is you. What matters a lot too is everyone else because they can make your life very difficult um, or they can uh, you know, create dangerous situations you never anticipated. The other people are a big problem a lot of times. It, it's not always just you, I promise. And listen, even if you live in a rural environment like I do, you know, I've speak, spoken to uh, people in the law enforcement industry who have basically told me if you live out in the rural environment, you're out in the sticks, you're getting stolen from on a weekly basis. You just don't know it yet. 
And that is something that I'm taking to heart for sure. And it makes sense, right? There's a lot of stuff on large property that you might not pay attention to all the time. And those little, you know, pieces of scrap metal or who knows what else you had, you know, out in your garage that's disconnected from your home. Uh, all those little things just kind of go away after a period of time. And you might not even remember you had them. So all these things are important to keep in mind. Okay. Let's see. Razor Wire says, I have to think just about me because I'm already entirely alone and will be when I bug out. Well, what you need to do is try your best to network, even if it's through online interaction. And when I say that, what I mean is regardless of where people are, having a network can help you out, especially just emotionally or mentally. You can say, hey, guys, this is happening. What's everybody's thoughts on this? Like it allows you to bounce at least ideas and everything off each other. And then you might be able to link up with people in your area based on that. So if you haven't actually been to the Discord, make sure you check that out uh, because I do have channels there for each state and we have a pretty uh, active community over there. So, so if that's something you're interested in, Razor Wire, I will go ahead and get you the link right now just so um, everybody has it. And if you want to join the Discord, I just put it in the live chat for y'all. Uh, and it just allows you to kind of interact with other like-minded people. So I think that's relatively important, okay? So this is what I am trying to say regarding this signal situation. Let me know in the chat what you think about it. But I do think that if another strike group heads that way, you should anticipate things to get much more interesting very, very quickly thereafter. And that's how I'm operating right now, at least on my timeline of preparedness and my level of threat indication when it comes to what I might have to do in reaction to a war going hot to the point of it affecting us here, possibly on the homeland. Uh, because I think if you, you should probably operate under the assumption that our most vulnerable points are the most likely to be hit if we are in a hot conflict with any country at this point in time, especially with how porous or completely open the southern border is, right? Um, and for me, the number one most fragile part of our country when it comes to our infrastructure and our national security is the power grid. So you might not want to, you know, just assume you're safe just because, you know, no one's going to land boats on the beach where you live right? Uh, if you're out of power, you're out of power. And then it goes back to the conversation we just had, which is the general population becomes a big problem. Okay. So a radiated runner says World War III will come here if not already. You will be affected by it somehow. That's just how it works. Um, let's see. Hey, guns coast to coast. Good to see you. Uh, unconfirmed reports that Iran is planning on closing the Strait of Hormuz, shut down all oil from the Persian Gulf. Um, I've heard similar rumblings, uh, and I can't verify that that's the case, but if that happens, that should be a huge wake up call for anybody who's concerned about what's going on right now. Um, uh, rip curl readiness. Thanks for being here and modding as well. Uh, and yes, I agree with that. So, uh, let's see here. Let's move on. There's some other things to talk about tonight. And I think that we have to understand how this all works because we're no longer just in your typical conflict scenario. Okay. U.S. officials to meet Jewish leaders as anti-Semitism surges on campuses. Tensions between pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian groups have sprung up on college campuses due to the ongoing war in Gaza. Okay, Listen, hold on before you start freaking out and typing away. Just hold on a second, I promise. Officials from the administration of U.S. President Joe Biden have voiced alarm at a rise in anti-Semitism at United States universities and plan to meet with American Jewish leaders to discuss steps to counter the surge. Tensions between pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian groups have sprung up on college campuses due to the ongoing Israel-Hamas war. This is a product, a direct product of propaganda. And the job of the fifth generation warfare fighters is being done very well right now. And if you don't think that a lot of what recently happened over there is leverage for creating additional division and strife within our country in order to weaken us even further before a large conflict scenario erupts, uh, then you need to study up on how this next generation of warfare is really defined and how it's working. Everything's going according to plan, in my opinion, based on what we're seeing right now. We're tearing each other apart. Nobody can agree on anything. And you know what the easiest uh, enemy to defeat is? An enemy that does not have a united front. An enemy that does not have shared goals, right? If every Everybody was on the same page and we said, we need to defeat this particular country. Uh, it would make it a lot easier to do. And if you think about, you know, World War II and everything else, yeah, was there lots of propaganda back then? Of course there was. 
But in general, a large portion of the country was very, very much on board with doing what we had to do. That's not the case anymore. And our adversaries have done an excellent job of sowing division in this country and using these situations to make it even worse. And that's why we're seeing all of this strife and all of this chaos occurring. It's part of the campaign and it's extremely effective. So I just want you to keep this in mind when you see stories like this and when you see all the protests and everything happening on college campuses and everything else regarding that, your own personal opinions are fine. But one thing we have to keep in mind, and this is my opinion, is that if we're seen as the enemy, no matter what, we're the enemy. So please try to remember that, okay? If, you know, fighters show up on your street and knock on your door and you answer and you're like, hey, actually, I'm with you guys. Do you think that's really going to change anything for them based on their mission parameter? Do you think you think that's going to make it so they're not going to do anything to you or or possibly, you know, change their mind about what they were going to do for your to your your neighborhood like oh well this guy said he's on our side so we're good here that's just not how it works they might have you believe that but that is literally not going to happen so um please keep that in mind more than anything else all of this division and everything it's it's being done to you it's not part of the equation until it was created to be okay sorry i don't know how else to say that i'm trying to make everybody aware of how this works i mean it is the name of the game at this point in time, in 2023, it just is, right? So let's move forward with that. How are we tearing ourselves apart? Well, you just saw, but what about everybody else? This division is actually so beneficial for the entire global alliance against the Western society, let's just call it, right? This is where what they're doing, and it's going very well for them. Please keep this in mind, okay? Internet edgelords alike have this idea, and I might be one of them, so you know, include me if you'd like, uh, that the internet has made us all geniuses. And unfortunately, you, you can't become a genius by just reading things on the internet. Just because you read it on the dark web doesn't mean it's true. Just because you saw a meme doesn't mean it's true. But a huge portion of our population now believes that they know more than anyone else because they saw it on an obscure site on the internet, which means that that's probably more true than the other stuff they're reading. And that's exactly what they would love you to believe. You have to vet your research. You have to verify sources. It's just, it's impossible these days in many ways. And unfortunately, um, they're winning because of it. Israel to reevaluate diplomatic relationship with Turkey after Erdogan's threats. Now, this is a developing story, but this is um, interesting. This is from today, October 30th. Okay. This is from the Defense of Democracies Foundation, whatever that means. What you should take away from this more than anything else is that our NATO ally is not on board with our ally, which means we're not coordinating very well, which is not good for us in the sense of being on the global stage in a hot conflict. Israeli Foreign Minister Eli Cohen stated on October 28th that he ordered the return of diplomatic representatives from Ankara in order to conduct a reevaluation of the relations between Israel and Turkey. The announcement came on the same day as a harsh anti-Israel speech by Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. And this is where it gets weird. This is what you should definitely pay attention to. John Rage, the crew cut and the shaved beard would definitely be a sign, but I mean, that's like... That's, yeah, that's when things are getting real crazy. So, yeah, keep an eye out for that because the only reason I'm doing that if things are bad enough to where I really have to concern myself with that because otherwise, you know, my wife is not going to stay with me if I have a shaved baby face. So I got to do what I got to do, right? Addressing hundreds of thousands of his supporters at a rally in Istanbul's Atatürk airport, Erdogan called Israel's actions in the Gaza Strip a massacre. Erdogan said that Turkey, a NATO member, is preparing to tell the whole world that Israel is a war criminal. He also appeared to threaten military action against Israel, saying that Turkey can come at any night unexpectedly. Now, that is some interesting language. Regardless, regardless of any of that, you can agree with Turkey if you want. You don't have to agree with Turkey. I don't care how you feel about it. What you should look at regarding that is the fact that our NATO ally, is not on the same page as us as a country, not as you as an individual, but as the United States government when it comes to who's supporting who in that region. And that creates some serious instability as well as some questionable 
relationships. And I mean, I just don't know what to say about it in many ways because it creates a very complex scenario that only benefits our adversaries. That's it. This doesn't help anybody. It doesn't, it doesn't. It really just doesn't help anybody. It only hurts NATO, which we're allies with, regardless of how you feel about the funding and everything else. And um, yeah, we're not on the same page. So more fifth generation warfare seems to be working out very well. Like I said, common goals, the united front, that's relatively important when you want to win a conflict. And if you have members of an alliance that can't even decide whose side they're on in a situation, um, how does that look for us? If we enter a conflict where we need NATO or where NATO needs us, I'm, I mean, let's be honest, they need us, but we also use them for staging military bases, forward operating bases, nuclear weapons being stored at certain locations that are more strategic, right? So yeah, Razor Wire says these days NATO hurts NATO. That's in, that's where it's at. So Scoped Wrecker says a lot of Turkey warships have come from us. That might be true. And recently they actually just had a little parade. Now, I found this only to be interesting because of its proximity to the recent comments from Erdogan regarding the fact that they could just show up in the middle of the night in Israel. That's a weird thing to, to say, and that's a threat. I don't care how anyone else wants to perceive it. If North Korea or China said, watch out, USA, we might just show up in the middle of the night one day, we'd all take it as a direct threat. So I don't see how Israel takes it as any other type of language besides a threat. Turkish Navy to conduct its largest parade in history in honor of centenary of Republic of Turkey, right? This is a huge naval parade of 100 ships, okay? The only reason I brought it up is because of their recent rhetoric regarding Israel and how they think that they're committing war crimes, which means they think they should be punished militarily for that. And then they immediately thereafter, I know it's their 100 year anniversary, I got it. But we all know there's a lot of parades and everything else right before Russia invaded Ukraine. So I'm just going to say that anything that moves to this measure of, of ships and just military movements in general should be at least watched or seen through a keen eye. Not saying this is anything particular. I'm just saying it is concerning based on the timing regarding everything else that just occurred. Okay. So, Razorwire, my Discord name is Knight of the SHTF Order. Perfect. <laughs> I don't know why I keep catching Razorwire. You know why? It's because he keeps tagging me. If you guys want me to respond to you or see your comment, make sure you tag me just so I can see it because uh, it pops up orange and it's a little easier for me to see uh, before it cuts through. And then um, uh, let's see here. Do, do, do. Irradiated Runner says, Krisky said it best. I just hope both teams have fun. So that's the thing. This is all going to happen regardless of how you feel about it. Like, keep that in mind. You don't have a say. The United States government's not going to ask you your opinion on what they should or shouldn't do in this situation. But you should also keep in mind that if a foreign entity considers America its enemy because of the actions of the U.S. government, you should be aware of the fact that you are considered an enemy as well. Civilian, you know, title doesn't necessarily protect you if you haven't noticed lately. So don't just, don't just assume you're good because you're just, you know, hanging out in your mom's basement on the internet all day long. And you're not, you don't really, you don't want to be involved. You don't get to choose to not be involved sometimes. That's just how life works, right? So, uh, Sherman Sales, I see you and I appreciate it. <laughs> now, um, I do want to mention that Genesis Gold Group is another large supporter of the channel. And if you are looking to back your financial assets with something a little bit more stable, like precious metals, make sure you check them out. It helps out the channel. They are big supporters of the channel. They're great guys over there. They're faith-driven in the sense that they have a certain set of morals that they operate with. It's magicpreppergold.com if you want to go check that out. But they can get you in when it comes to precious metals. Regardless of whether or not it's through like a gold-backed IRA or if it's direct precious metals delivered to your door, whatever it is that you want to get from them or even just ask them about when it comes to advice, make sure you check them out. Gold is like at $2,000 an ounce now, which is crazy talk. But that's where it's at. And uh, I don't know what else to say about it. Um, and if you guys don't mind, and this, I'm going to put this in the chat real quick. But if you don't mind, 
I would really appreciate if you guys could nominate me for the Gundies. The Gundies is a basically like a gun tuber award type thing that's actually pretty cool. But um, I got nominated last year for most likely to survive the zombie apocalypse. And I wouldn't mind being nominated for that again. So if you guys want to go check that out, I just put a link in the live chat. It would help me out if you would nominate me. And if I'm able to go, it could be a really good time. So um, that's just something that's cool that's happening. And the actual nominations are cut off tomorrow. So that'd be the last day to be able to do it. And that's why I wanted to bring it up. So thanks so much if you're willing to do that for me. It really helps. Uh, Liberty Offroad, thanks for nominating me. I appreciate it. I'll put that in the chat real quick one more time. So uh, in Epocracy, you're 49 in your mom's basement and she just brought you pizza rolls. That is awesome. But I also hope she has meatloaf ready to go relatively soon. So we have other conflict zones to pay attention to too. I don't think they're as high of a threat level right now when it comes to forcing direct U.S. involvement into a broader conflict right this second. But they have the potential to do it at any point in time. And that's why we also have to keep an eye on it. I don't know why I keep freezing tonight, by the way, but... Uh, maybe because it's freezing cold. And in case you don't know, when I changed my studio, I ended up in a part of the house that's not central air. So it's not as warm in here as one might think. And that's why I'm wearing a beanie and everything else. So I apologize if my appearance isn't up to par for you, but which does happen to me on a regular basis. People get really weird about how I look for some reason. Anyway, do you guys know that this happened? Because these things kind of just seem to float under the radar lately. And it's kind of a big deal. Biden. This happened five days ago. Biden says U.S. is willing to fight China on behalf of the Philippines following ship collision near Disputed Island. I don't, like, I'm not even hearing about half of this stuff anymore. But these things are just happening without us, like, having the ability to even be aware of them. But this could happen any, at any point over there. President Biden said Wednesday that the U.S. military is willing to fight nuclear-armed China on behalf of the Philippines after ships from the two Asian countries collided near a disputed, unpopulated island in the South China Sea. The United States defense agreement with the Philippines is ironclad and any attack on the Filipino aircraft vessels or armed forces will invoke our mutual defense treaty with the Philippines, Biden said during a joint military press conference at the White House alongside Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. Okay. Not a big fan. Okay. But uh, that's what's happening. So, Arbor Prepper, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. And just so you guys know, um, yeah, Sergeant Rudy, I'm glad you got the AC on. I wish I did too. Um, I do have a buddy heater, Grissy Amimo, uh, but, you know, I try to save energy and I try to save my propane stash in, until I, like, really need it. So um, I can always throw on a sweater and a beanie. I don't mind, right? Um, so Harbor Pepper, thanks for reminding me on that. Um, I do have the members-only live chat tonight. That is for YouTube channel members as well as Subscribestar members. And I do actually give out a monthly preparedness incentive on Subscribestar. And it's five bucks a month, but you get exclusive content. You get direct communication with me. And... I send out legitimate preparedness incentives. So I sent Harbor Prepper a range bag from Midway USA because they're also supporting me over there in Subscribestar. So I appreciate any support that I get from there. And if you're a YouTube channel member, you can hit that join button below and then you can come hang out on the private live stream tonight, which is just me casually hanging out and chatting with everybody uh, because not everything needs to be as direct or in sequence as these conversations, which I try to make more valuable for your time. So, um, Albert Correa, who the frig cares that you are freezing? I mean, I do. So there you go. And that, you know, to me actually matters. So we also have something crazy that recently happened. Um, and I think that this also isn't getting a lot of attention because of everything going on in the world right now. But I want to definitely bring it to your attention because um, the whole Russia-Ukraine thing has kind of been swept under the rug at this point. People are kind of like, oh, you know, paying attention to Israel now. I'm paying attention to Gaza. I'm paying attention to everything going on over there. And I get that because that suddenly sprung up into being a very contentious situation. But Russia is still doing Russia and Russia is still at war with Ukraine and we're still supplying Ukraine. And uh, they are more than willing to retaliate, apparently. So I want everybody to know what's happening. Russia practices massive retaliatory nuclear strike. The drill took place hours after Parliament's upper house voted to revoke the country's ratification of a global ban on nuclear testing. This was reported on October 26th, okay? So only a few days ago. Russia's military has conducted a massive retaliatory nuclear strike drill hours after the upper house of Parliament voted to revoke the country's ratification of a global ban on nuclear testing. 
The exercise, which involved the test launch of missiles from a land-based silo, a nuclear submarine, and from long-range bomber aircraft, was overseen by President Vladimir Putin. Russian state television showed Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu and Armed Forces Chief Valery Gerasimov briefing Putin by video link. Comrade Supreme Commander-in-Chief Shoigu said, addressing the president, he said the purpose of the drills was to practice dealing a massive nuclear strike with strategic offensive forces in response to a nuclear strike by the enemy. The drill comes 20 months since Russia began its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, and with Putin and Russian officials giving mixed signals about the possible use of nuclear weapons. Russia, which has the world's largest nuclear arsenal, has moved quickly in recent weeks to revoke its ratification of the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty in a move Moscow says is necessary to bring it into line with the United States, which has signed but never ratified the treaty. Wednesday's unanimous passage of the bill through the upper house means it now needs only Putin's signature to take effect. The CBT, CTBT, sorry, outlaws all nuclear explosions, including live tests of nuclear weapons. In addition to the U.S., it also yet to be ratified by China, India, Pakistan, North Korea, Israel, Iran, and Egypt. In a statement, the Kremlin said a Yars intercontinental ballistic missile was fired from a test site at a target in Russia's Far East. A nuclear-powered submarine launched a ballistic missile from the Barents Sea, and a Tu-95MS long-range bomber test-fired air-launched cruise missiles. The tasks planned in the course of the training exercise were fully accomplished, it said. Video footage of the exercise published by the Russian Ministry of Defense showed the land and submarine-based missiles striking into the night sky and nuclear-capable bomber aircraft taking off from an airfield under the cover of darkness. Russia carries out such exercises to test its so-called nuclear triad from time to time. The U.S. also carries out regular nuclear drills. There are concerns that Russia could move to resume nuclear tests to try to discourage the West from continuing to offer military support to Ukraine. Many Russian hawks have spoken in favor of a resumption of the tests. Putin said earlier this month he was not ready to say whether Russia needed to carry out live nuclear tests. So this is where we're at. Russia is practicing retaliatory nuclear strikes at this point in time, which, I mean, nuclear drills occur and we know militaries are always trying to be ready for anything that could happen but this should really show you the level of escalation that we're currently in i mean are they expecting to be hit with nuclear weapons or are they just trying to practice an actual preemptive strike under the guise of a retaliatory strike these are all things that you should be asking yourself and then make sure you're aware of how you would react in that situation uh, for me, it's kind of a difficult scenario because there's not really a lot of great options around me. Why? Because I'm in North Dakota, I'm near strategic missile locations, and uh, there are no fallout shelters anymore. The government stopped caring about us a long time ago. So what that does for me is just reminds me that that's always a lingering threat and then motivates me to get more work done on my own fallout shelter and to ensure that I have somewhere to take cover if need be. Now, the explosion is not something that's easily survivable, right? So luckily, I'm not that close to the nearest silo, but who knows with the size of these weapons and what kind of a strike they might try to, you know, actually pull off. But when it comes to fallout, that's something more survivable, but you actually have to have something in place to survive it or else you're still going to die just more agonizingly and later, right? So I'm trying my best to get all those things prioritized and figured out while also juggling just basic preparedness, right? I still want to make sure my backup power system is working properly. I still want to make sure that I have enough water on hand so that even if my well decides to stop doing what it's supposed to do, I can still retrieve water while also uh, having some on hand to not necessarily, you know, have an emergency where I don't have any at all. There's a lot of things that you have to put in place and be, you know, working on as a prepper that aren't involving you know, World War III type scenarios, but all of that hardens you to those scenarios regardless. So use this information as a guide. Use it as a way to anticipate. And when I say that, I don't mean anticipate a nuclear strike on your location. I mean, anticipate the actions and reactions of the general population. They're the ones who are going to create the biggest issues for you most likely. Is the possibility of an Iranian sleeper cell activating in your area uh, and 
basically creating a situation where you would need to act defensively at least possible? Yes, of course it is. Is it highly likely? Still probably not, right? Is it becoming more likely? I would say it is becoming more likely. So those things exist, of course. But your priorities should still maintain a similar level of basic preparedness, right? If you don't have a month's worth of food, but you have four AR-15s, like you're doing it wrong. Even though I want to have four AR-15s, right? But I also have a month's worth of food. So I can have four AR-15s and not feel bad about it. But you need to make sure you have those things in order. What makes more sense to me is having like two weeks worth of food and one AR-15. That's still better than a month's worth of food and no AR-15, at least in my opinion. Why? Because who knows what's going to happen. And having the ability to defend yourself and secure your assets, including your food, might be more important than we realize. So you can't just go all in on any one thing either. You should have a well-rounded approach to your preparedness. But don't forget things that you think are unreasonable just because it hasn't happened yet, right? I didn't even own a gun when I was held up at gunpoint. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't expect to need a gun until I needed a gun. And then I was like, man, I'm going to get a gun. And that started an entirely expensive journey. But here we are, right? And the same thing can be be applied to any of this other preparedness conversation that we're having, right? You You can literally never need a gas mask, but once you need one, you need one. And that's the only time you'll probably need it, but dang, you really need it right then and there. And that's just how these things work. I might never open some of my food storage. That's fine. I don't care. If I end up passing away in the future and my kids inherit my food storage, uh, then great. And like, you know, 25 years, am I going to die from old age? No. Could I die between now and 25 years because of some freak accident or some weird health thing? Sure, it can happen. So I don't care if I never open that stuff. That doesn't mean I don't want to have it. That doesn't mean it might not come in handy. But the same way people approach things like, you know, oh, you don't need that AR-15 or you don't need all that ammo. Well, I don't know if I'm going to need 25 years of food storage either. But I think having food storage is a good idea and I'm going to have it because it's still a good idea. That's kind of how it all works, right? We have to balance it and understand the value of every single category of preparedness that we have. And this whole situation, this signal of another strike group entering the Mediterranean to join up with the previous two that are already there in station at this point in time, should let you know that it's time to kick things into overdrive, especially when it comes to personal security and maybe avoiding places you don't necessarily need to go. Maybe avoiding leaving town for for inordinate amounts of time when it's not necessarily required, right? I don't know if going on vacation in the middle of a global conflict is the best idea. So like these are things that you can use to your advantage to give yourself the best situation possible rather than, okay, if that other strike group goes, then I'm you know going to have to bug out to the middle of nowhere. And that's, that's the, the signal. No, the, the signal is to let you know that, all right, things are going hot. And now we're going to be at the point in time where everybody else starts to realize it, right? When Operation Iraqi Freedom happened. Everyone knew about it. We all knew that this was occurring because it was finally being reported on. We were officially in a conflict with Iraq. Yeah, war wasn't declared, but like that's not even like a thing anymore, right? So basically, this will be your signal before that occurs. And that gives you a little bit more time to do what needs to be done. That's what I'm trying to do here. Nick Caputo, you stay well as well. I'm doing the best I can. Uh, and I honestly really appreciate all of you. Um, Let's see. Nick Caputo also said that water storage is not only expensive, but literally storing enough water is basically impossible. That's something that you have to admit and understand and then plan for. And that's just like bugging out. You cannot bring enough food with you bugging out. You will never have enough food with you to last you a lifetime. So why plan on having so much food with you that you won't need more food? You'll always need more food, just like water. You cannot carry enough water on your body to survive forever. You're going to have to get more water. So you have to have ways and ideas in mind that will allow you to keep procuring food and water throughout your life, regardless of whether or not you can get it at the grocery store, right? So approach everything with the same approach you take to water. Yeah, you can never store enough. You're right. And that's the same with just about anything else regarding preps. Is there a level of good enough to get through most generalized emergencies? Yes. But is there ever quite enough? Probably not. So you have to have plans to 
be able to produce or procure more in the future, regardless of how you plan on doing that. Let's see here. Um, Bad Robert, Bad Bobber says there may be a carrier group headed for or is off the coast of Iran. Well, and these are all things that you know we can pay attention to, and that will be your clue. If they join up with the other two, a lot of things are going to get weird very quickly. Okay, uh, and then we also have. Let's see here. Quentin Smith says, I need more hens. I think that's always a good idea. Durgan, I'm eating a lot of rice right now and I have to do some work making it anything but boring as hell. And that is part of the problem. So if you are going to store a lot of rice, which is totally fine because we know it's the most affordable dry good that you can store that has pretty dense calories, right? It's, it's kind of hard to beat when it comes to the price versus calorie ratio, um, but it's awfully empty of nutrients and it's also very bland. So always be prepping more than just one thing and make sure that you have ways to spice it up a little bit. I think bouillon is a really good thing to, to prepare and store um, in order to kind of add some flavor as well as some nutrient value to any type of meal you might be making in that environment. Um, seasonings are great. Salt is very important. Make sure you're storing salt. I don't know if anybody talks about it enough, but like salt is a, a basic necessity of human survival, right? And then salt also has all the other benefits and all of the other applications that you can use it for. Whether or not it comes to maintaining a level of health by, you know, like gargling salt water, uh, using it to, you know, you know, clean or whatever you might have to do. You can also use it to store things like meats, right? So salt is huge and highly overlooked in the preparedness community when it comes to at least the level of, um, you know, focus that's placed on it. So yes, all those things are going to be important. And I think that's a good thing to bring up, Durgan, because um, a lot of us definitely store a lot of rice, but you got to also have ways to make that rice edible and at least somewhat enjoyable for the long term. And not to mention, that's also how I approach my freeze dried foods. All my freeze dried food storage to me is just rice supplement, right? I mean, basically, that's what it comes down to. Hey, I'm going to make some rice and then we're going to make one of these bags of, of, you know, Mountain House or Peak or, you know, Valley Food Storage or whatever it is. And then we're going to add that on top of the rice to make it kind of like, you know, a casserole or whatever you want to call it, right? And then what that does is it allows you to get higher calorie intake. It allows you to fill up your bellies a little bit better and have some flavor in the process with additional nutrition while not having to spend so much money that your only food storage is freeze-dried food because I can't afford a year's supply of freeze-dried food. I mean, it's just so expensive. But I think having it as supplemental nutritional and flavor value is actually very important. And that's how I approach it. And I think that's going to work the best, uh, at least in my opinion. So uh, uh, Ahan Breshmazmi says... Uh, Salt is nectar. <laughs> and I agree. All right. Uh, let's see here. Rebecca Snavely, I got 50 pounds of salt for eight bucks two years ago. Couldn't pass up the deal. No, I mean, that's that's a good deal. And good luck getting, you know, 50 pounds of anything for eight bucks anymore. I mean, geez. Um, let's see. Red Dawn Ready, have you tried any spring kits for the P365 XL or macro? No. In general, I keep, um, you know, my carry guns and Anything I plan on using in a self-defense situation, and I generally, at least when it comes to handguns, I keep most of the internals factory. And the reason I do that is just because it, it, they were designed a, at a, to a certain degree in order to be as reliable as they're supposed to be. And I don't like playing around with that for multiple reasons, warranty issues, liability issues, as well as, you know, just wanting to ensure that everything maintains its level of reliability that I intend to use it for. And that if it doesn't, I don't want it to be my fault. I want it to be uh, because of, you know, manufacturing or who knows what else. So um, that's, that's just how I approach it. So when it comes to my handguns, they're generally going to be uh, factory internals. Uh, obviously when it comes to rifles, there's a lot of nuance there, especially when it comes to ARs and how ubiquitous they are and universal they are. Uh, you're going to have triggers. You're going to have, you know, all types of different, components based on you know use case scenarios such as like a uh you know a niche charging handle that has gas vents for your suppressor so it's all over the place when it comes to that um let's see here nick s says dry beans are easy to store high in protein and fats and cheap yep now the one thing I'll, i want to mention real quick just to give everybody something to consider too is when it comes to dried goods and you're storing things like beans or rice like this is just my experience so you know maybe your mileage may vary but uh the older the dry goods become, they, the, the longer they generally take to rehydrate, right? And beans, as well as rice, can be a lot more difficult to prepare than you might think if you've never tried to prepare them like from scratch in that, in that way, 
right? If you're used to like cracking open a can of beans and then using like a rice cooker, you're not in the same ballpark as trying to cook rice over like an open flame and trying to get beans to, you know, become soft in a reasonable amount of time. So make sure you're actually learning how to cook these things beforehand too. Like don't just expect yourself to be able to be a gourmet rice and bean chef come the apocalypse when you've never cooked them before, but you had them stored this whole time. It's going to be a lot more difficult than you might think. That's just, that's just my opinion. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Pete Fletch, you hope I stocked up on 22 long rifle. Yeah, I got a lot of 22. Um, and I, I, I mean, I think that's always the, so it, it always goes in a similar wave, right? 22, uh, goes after, you know, like five, five, six and stuff, because everyone thinks the same way. I'll, I'll use 22 for training now because it's still affordable and I'll get a 22 dedicated upper. And that way I can still have the same manual of arms, whatever. And then you move on and then everyone else had that same idea. And then now 22 is also in short supply. So like, it's just a herd mentality. There's nothing we can do about it. And no, it's not my fault. Stop. Just please. You know, like I said, in the, in the, in that first ammo video, I was giving you information that was already old news, basically. And I can tell you right now, from a distributor standpoint, or at least from what I have access to, I have I can't even order five five six wholesale now, like at all. There's there's none. Not even the twenty five dollars a box stuff is there. There if I if I filter five five six NATO, there is none. It's it's just gone. I cannot order any. So just want to let you guys know that it's not me. It, it's just the way things are going. And then I have seen some people say, you know, by the way. Uh, some of these manufacturers or some of these companies seem to be stockpiling millions of rounds. So a lot of it's actually them artificially creating a shortage. That's just, that's not necessarily how this all works. And, and regardless, listen, artificial or not, doesn't matter. Like that just doesn't matter. What matters is that the shortage is there. So if I can't get it, that's what matters. The reason behind it doesn't. I don't have any control over what these giant corporations do when it comes to ammo and everything else they have on hand. That's just not up to me. So all I can tell you is what I can or cannot get. That's what matters. So reasons are there for other conversations. But at the end of the day, like the big thing that matters is that you, if you can get it or not. So um, Rip Curl Readiness, I know I saw that article too. It's just nothing I can do about it. You know, I have I have that much of an effect on the community that people will just go buy all the ammo. So, <laughs> oh man, it is what it is, right? Um, and Tahoe Blaze, SG Ammo and target sports have five so everyone has five five six you can go buy five five six i'm not telling you you can't get it i'm telling you i cannot get it at, at wholesale prices from a distributor now which means that the retailers who are selling it to you also cannot get it from those wholesalers now which means that once that stock they have is gone they either won't have any or it will become extremely expensive that's the difference. I, I hope I have explained that enough times now to where everyone kind of understands, like, I'm not telling you you can't find it on the retail side. I'm telling you that the retailers can't order it from the wholesale distributor that they usually get it from. That's that's why you should be, like, aware of the fact that it's, it's in short supply. Okay, so, anyway. Uh... Understood, brother. What I'm saying is a few people learned lessons from the 2020, 2012 pandemic. Yeah, exactly. Ammo panic. Yep. Uh, Tahoe Blaze, no worries. I just wanted to clarify that because a lot of people have had that same misunderstanding and I want to make sure that I'm very clear with it because there are a lot of people who are like, um, you know, you're, you're, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're an idiot. I can find 556 five, right now for you. And it's like, no, 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 that's, <laughs> there, there's a difference. I promise. Uh, Durgan says, uh, I have two crock pots. Yes, I also have crockpots, and I used my crockpot today. So uh, I'm glad we're on the same page there. So anyway, um, da, da, da. Donnie Taylor says, I'm sorry, but I can't do this, people. But this is just prepper. Oh, ORN, got it. Look towards more of being a producer, not a consumer. Well, here's the thing. Produce all you want. Um I can't produce very much and I have plenty of acreage. Why? Because it still takes a lot of time, energy, and investment to get to the point where you're producing. So I will be producing uh, and I think everyone should produce, but you know what? Not everybody can just grow a farm's worth of food. Not everybody can grow a garden. Not everybody lives in a situation where that's possible for them or has the time or the financial resources to be able to do so. And this information is just to give you something to work with when it comes into timing and strategically planning, especially Especially for those people who live in environments where they can't produce food or produce enough to eat for the rest of their lives. You know, that's not something that everyone has access to. And so this information can give those people at least a heads up or an indicator as to whether or not they're 
environment will become more dangerous or more sporadic or chaotic in a certain amount of time based on the current situation. So for those people, it it is very valuable because they can't just go produce food. Everyone's goal is to have land or to be able to sustain themselves off their property for the rest of their life, but it's not sustainable for everyone. And in fact, if everyone could, there wouldn't be enough land for everyone to do it. So it's, I understand what you're saying. Trust me, I get it. But I, I, I get sick of this whole like, oh, this is just fear mongering or blah, blah, blah. No, it's information. Do with it what you will. I use information to my advantage. If you don't think there's an advantage to the information, then don't use it. But an, information is a tool just as much as a firearm is, just as much as your backhoe is, and just as much as your garden is. You can apply it to whatever you need to apply it to in order to strategically plan your preparedness. So I just wanted to make sure you're aware of the fact that that's how I should, I approach these situations. You, uh, I have these, what, what would you like me to do on a live stream to, to, to be more prepared, right? I can't grow corn behind me right this second, but I can share information that at least has relevance to the current scenario and can give people something to work with rather than being in the dark until suddenly everything changes right before their eyes. And I think when it comes to panic buying and just the visceral reaction of the general population when it comes to realizing that we're suddenly in a war, I think we're going to see that much worse because of social media and because of the lack of information that these people have been given over the last few years, and they will be caught off guard and surprised by it. And the first thing they're going to do is Google, what should I get for World War III? And they're going to look at every other video that's ever been made about that. And then they're going to buy the crap out of everything they see without any actual planning involved. And then anything that you might have needed or anything that you might have planned for could be out the window. So that's what you should use this information for. It's a tool that you can also use. That's like saying reading a book is worthless because really you should just be growing food. I don't know what else to say. Sorry, but you got me on, on the wrong day for that one, I guess. Anyway, um, and and it's just, it, just it, it feels like normalcy bias mixed with a, uh, a complacency, right? And one of the biggest things that everyone should take away from what happened to Israel, right, on October 7th, when they were attacked by Hamas, is that complacency kills the cat, right? Because that's what happened there. They got complacent in their situation. They didn't have enough security forces on the border. They didn't have enough defenses put together in order to take care of the people in that region if they were under attack. The people there were disarmed and they were complacent with the government being able to protect them because the government said they could. So a lot of complacency led to a situation where civilians were slaughtered in mass, right? So like, Had those people had more information to work with, it's possible they could have been better prepared for it. I don't know. And I can't say that's true or not. All I'm saying is is that that's the goal here is to be using the information for betterment of your preparedness, not to just get all worked up in a frenzy and go, you know, I don't know, drink a beer at the edge of the river while you cry yourself to sleep. Anyway. (laughs) And on that note, I think we're going to... um, uh, and the live stream because we're at an hour and I got to get ready for the members only chat. So thank you guys so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I think that we are actually, um, you know, in a good position here in the United States as of right now, but things can change very quickly. And I want everyone here to be aware of the fact that my goal here is to help you get prepared, whether or not that's through a motivational conversation, whether or not that's through information or whether or not that's through concepts related to gear, equipment, food, or anything else related to that. So uh, if you enjoy what we do here, hit the subscribe button below because I don't ever get to say that on the live stream because I forget just about every single time. But besides that, that's going to be it for Magic Prepper.